Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh. There's Chuck. Jerry's here. And if you'd never noticed before, we're speaking English. So we're going to talk about the history of the English language because that's the one we use right now. Yeah. Uh, the briefest history, because we certainly could have done like a really robust full episode on this. Yeah. Uh, but I like the short version. And we want to thank EnglishClub.com uh, and in particular, uh, TheConversation.com and a professor of, of lit at the University of Bristol named Ad Putter. Uh, go Fighting Abbeys. <laughs> is that what it is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got me again. Uh, but anyway, Putter wrote a really good article that um, that helped out with this one. But we're talking about the history of the English language briefly uh, because I was just kind of curious, like, who were the first people to speak English? And the first English is what you have to talk about first, which is, of course, Old English, which came about uh, right after the Romans – left Britain. Uh, this is, you know, this was a very long time ago. They colonized Britain, but they were like, things aren't going so great in the Roman Empire, so we're going to leave. Yeah. So, um, it's just interesting. The Romans spoke Latin, but the Brits spoke Celtic. And then after the Romans left, because their empire was crumbling all around them, the Brits still kept speaking Celtic, but not for very long, because the Romans had basically been occupying Britain, but they had also been in turn protecting it. But as the Roman Empire crumbled, it left Britain totally vulnerable and open to invasion. And in very short order, that's exactly what happened. Three Germanic tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, all uh, basically came down from northern Germany, Denmark area, and said, we we own this place now. You guys are going to start speaking like us. Yeah, they spoke what's called North Sea Germanic. And those Celtic speakers were kind of, they ended up where they ended up, which was north and west in what we now call Ireland and Scotland and Wales. Um, so the uh, the Angles, which was one of those Germanic tribes, um, like you've ever heard Anglo-Saxon, mm -hmm. that was because they were the Angles and the Saxons and mm -hmm. the Jutes. Two of the three of those tribes were the Angles and the Saxons. And once they got to Britain, their language was referred to as what we would call Old English or Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, it's, it's the original form of English, and this was used in the early Middle Ages. But this is not anything that you would recognize as English as we know it today, except for just a few words here and there. Yeah, like um, his, he, um, some of these really, really old words. And remember, he, they think, is possibly – like as old as humanity as far right. as words go, um, that was already in use. Um, but, yeah, it, it didn't bear much of a, a resemblance. Um, and so Old English, Chuck, was was in use, I think, from about 450 to 1100 CE. Yeah. And, you know, if the, the original thing that got me looking for this was if they could pinpoint, like, not necessarily the people, but who the first English speakers were. Mm -hmm. But our – friend, Professor Putter here, actually does name a couple of people. Uh, and this is, you know, this is sort of as legend goes. Uh, but when uh, these Germanic tribes came through, they asked a couple of those leaders, uh, Hengist and Horsa, to to come in and help protect the country. And they showed up. They And of course, again, this is, this is as the story goes, so we, we really don't know if it's true or not. But they would have been the ones that brought in this Old English. So technically, you could say, that they were maybe the first English speakers as we know it as Old English. That's so fascinating. Like, if these guys aren't legendary, they are the first English speakers in England or Britain. Yeah. So um, Old English stuck around until um, the Normans came along. So in 1066, William the Conqueror, the head of the Normans, he was the Duke of Normandy, which is in France today, showed up in England and said, Hengist, Horsa, you guys are a few hundred years old. It's time for you to hand over the reins to me, William the Conqueror. And it just so happened, since he was from what's today part of modern France, he spoke what you would kind of recognize as a type of French. And so the Normans brought French to England. But rather than um, it becoming totally widespread, it actually became part of um, what Professor Putter calls a linguistic class division where the royal court and the upper classes spoke the king's French, and then the lower classes continued to speak Old English. 
Yeah. And what's going to happen here, of course, and as we'll see, as England got to conquering for hundreds of years, you pick up on words as you move about the earth. And in this case, uh, a lot of French words were added to uh, what was now known as Middle English. Do you you want to hear one that I guessed was right? Yeah. Sausage. Oh, yeah. Sausage. Sausage. Yeah. (laughs) Let's take a break. Uh, When we come back, we'll talk about a big change that happened to Middle English pronunciation that linguists are still trying to figure out right after this. Uh, so this is like if you've ever read uh, Chaucer, which I did in college, uh, like the Canterbury Tales, this is – I thought like we read Old English some in college, but there's no way because when I saw examples of Old English, mm-hmm. it's not even decipherable hardly. <laughs> uh, what I was reading was Middle English, and and that's what Chaucer was. And that was – you know, that's a challenge as well. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely wasn't Old English. Um, and actually toward the latter part of Middle English – is when something called the Great Vowel Shift happened, Mm -hmm. which basically shortened vowel sounds, like a lot. And it happened pretty quickly, apparently. Yeah, they Uh, used to say for sheep, they would say shape. Oh, I thought you were going to say they said (laughs) sheep. No, no. And I didn't understand how he said that shortened from shape to sheep. Sheep sounds like it's longer than shape. But there was a huge change in vowel pronunciation in English around this time. And from what I saw, they're totally baffled as to why this happened. Yeah, They just know that it did around this time. And that actually contributed to another huge change in the English language, at least spoken English, with this huge great vowel shift. Yeah. And then then from there, the changes were uh, much more subtle. It was like I said, England was conquering from all over the world. So little words got added here and there. Printing was a thing now, so they were like, you know, we need to kind of standardize everything uh, because people are are reading for the first time, and books are kind of cheap, mm-hmm. and they're more available. So the dialect of London, which is where the printing industry was, you know, sort of lodged at first, uh, became the dialect of the English language and the basis of the first English dictionary. Uh, this is what we would call basically early modern English. Mm-hmm. And it's the English as, as we know it. Uh, the difference between early modern and late modern is just a lot more words because as the world evolved and technology evolved and things like that, you just needed more words. Well, plus also um, the Brits were pretty firmly in charge of the world for a while. Um, and they picked up a lot of words from different corners of the British Empire. So, um, for example, the word bandana comes from India. Did you know that? I did not know that. That's considered an English word, even though it wasn't originally an English word. It just got absorbed into the English language, and it became uh, a further addition to the modern, late modern English vocabulary. When you look at the word, though, it it totally looks like an Indian word. Yeah. Bandana was probably, I I imagine the A was changed, right? Yeah, and there's probably a Y in there somewhere that really juiced it up. Uh, one more person we should shout out, though, and this was uh, – I just thought was sort of an interesting addendum that Dr. Putter had found, was kind of shouting out the first poet uh, as far as English poet. And this was someone named uh, Cadmon, uh, C-A-E-D-M-O-N. Hail Cadmon. Uh, <laughs> and there was a, a historian monk uh, named uh, B-E-D-E. I don't, I don't know if that's Bede or – It's just Beatty. Oh, it is Beatty? Isn't that cute? That's so cute. Uh, but I think Beatty is the one who uh, committed Cadmon's story to history, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty great because Cadmon was someone who was illiterate, basically. And as the story goes, like, got this gift of poetry from God and was the first English poet as we know it, which means it's Old English, which means looking at these words is impossible. It looks like someone uh, was typing and, like, passed out or something. <laughs> it does. You're going you're gonna to take a shot at it? I mean— I'll try. Okay. Uh, these are the first lines of a poem which translated would mean, uh, now we must praise the guardian of the heavenly kingdom, the ruler's might, and his plan. 
uh, but it's written in Old English uh, as a poem. It was new, as in in you, new skulon hirion heophanris is weird, <laughs> methodis mit and his and his, and I got that part, mm-hmm. and his maj, majapunk. <laughs> So, yeah, Maj, is it that weird B? Is that, how do you pronounce the B? I don't even know. It's the thing that's, it's like, am I a B or am I a P? I can't decide. So I'll just. I'll be both for Halloween. I'll write it so it's confusing. I don't, I'm not sure what that even is. But Maj, we'll say bonk. Maj bonk means plan oh. in Old English. So from now on, I'm going to say, don't yeah. worry, I have a Maj bonk. <laughs> Oh, I hope you remember that. I want to say Maj Bonk from now on on the show. All right. We'll try to remember. All right. All right. So that's the Maj Bonk. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. I perfect. think you just cemented it. But it Great. is interesting to say that and and his were both – I mean, this is a thousand or almost 2,000 years ago that this guy wrote this. And you can look at it and say, oh, I, I, I noticed those two at least and his. Yeah. I don't know what the rest says, but and his is in there. Right. So that was it. And we take our hats off to Professor Putter and the University of Bristol, whose mascot I still could not find, even though I kind of looked it up while we were recording. Do they? Do you have mascots if you don't have sports teams? Uh, yeah, I think just to kind of create general goodwill among the student population. That's the real function of a mascot. I just didn't know if that was an American thing or what. I don't know. We'll find out. If you go to University of Bristol or even just know what their mascot is, write in and let us know, okay? All right. Good match, Punk. Short Stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.